Hey, everybody. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Wonder and Awe podcast. I'm Louis Schwartzberg. I'm going to be your host. And many of you know me from the films I make that celebrate life, making the invisible visible, because I love to take viewers on journeys through time and scale, focusing on important planetary issues, like my recent film, Fantastic Fungi. My work always tries to combine the how of science and the why of art. And I've always seen Wonder and Awe as that magical intersection between art and science. And this podcast in particular is going to fill that sweet spot. Because what I've learned over many years of my experience with filmmaking is that immersion in nature can increase our capacity for courage, creativity, kindness, and compassion. The components we need to save our world. And I believe that like shifting values shifts people's behavior. And that creates communities which can influence political choices. That's why I'm really proud that today's podcast is supported by the Fetzer Institute. They're helping to build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us? And us means the United States, that's where they did the study, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. You can explore these findings and more at thespiritualitystudy.org. Our guest today has been a champion for the common good for many years. I want to welcome my good friend, Dacher Keltner, to the podcast. He's the founding director of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley and professor of psychology there as well. He also has a best-selling, he's also the best-selling author of The Power of Paradox and Born to be Good. The Story of Awe, A Field Guide to Life of Wonder and Meaning, and a new book that will be coming out in 2021 about awe. Dacker is the host of the Greater Good Science Center's award-winning podcast, The Science of Happiness. And he's also a co-instructor at the Greater Good Science Center's popular online course of the same name. I want to invite you to share your own questions throughout this broadcast Please submit your questions in the comment sections wherever you're watching. Our team will be looking them for your comments. And don't for forget to tell us where you're writing from so we can create this kind of global mycelial connection. So, Dacker, welcome. How you doing, dude? Man, it's good to be with you, Louie, as always. And I love seeing your that that short montage of wonder and awe in your filmmaking. Uh, uh, what, thank what a you. delight. Thank you. We'll, we'll share that with the audience maybe a little later. Yeah. when we want to inspire a little bit of uh, visual wonder and awe. Um, so it's, it's in this lockdown period, Dacker, um, I know you've, you've been limited with your ability to go surfing, which I think is one way you experience wonder and awe. Um, tell me a little bit about, like, how are you managing that? Your, you know, the, what being in this lockdown mode and, and your desire to experience awe with the experiences that you enjoy doing? Yeah, I mean, in one sense, Louis, like a lot of people, um, you know, the CDC is re revealing these data about how much more anxious we are and lonely and so forth. And in one sense, the, the lockdown has been devastating because I don't have the opportunity to experience what is we find to be the most universal source of awe, which is other people, you know, mm -hmm. seeing their eyes, the stuff you film, right? They're being together. Um, but I've also taken the chance to use this as a kind of an opportunity to uh, engage in more contemplation, right? So think about what I'm grateful for, something that you filmed in your own work. Think about, you know, we just published a study on awe walks where a lot of Americans now and people around the world are walking more in socially distanced ways. And we figured out how to build a little bit of awe into it. You know, it's, it's almost like uh, seeing the world through your camera lens, which is slow it down, look at things a little bit longer, breathe it in, find the patterns out there. So it's it's been a mixed bag, you know, in some sense. I mean, I'm, I hunger for live music and the ocean and being together with other people, but it's been a chance to feel a sense of gratitude and, and find more awe right around me. Yeah. You know, one, one of the surprises when I did Fantastic Fungi, you know, we closed the ending on this idea that, you know, it's all about community how the yeah. mycelial network, you know, is this underground internet allowing plants and trees to connect to each other. 
And I think I took it for granted, this whole yeah. idea of, of, of connection, you know, but with friends and family, because when it's gone, all of a sudden, you know, you, you realize how important that is and, and then how grateful we should be for those kind of little things in life that we're unaware of. When the fires were happening, you know, the skies were, were brown, God. right? In Berkeley, everywhere. Horrifying. And all of a it was like, I, gotta, I have to remember, you know, in, in gender gratitude for blue sky. Another yeah. thing I took for granted. So yeah. uh, these, these are certainly, you know, challenging times. Um, well, let, you know, one of the things I'm really was interested in, and I didn't know this about you, Dacker, was that on the Pixar film Inside Out, yeah. you know, I think you were one of the consultants and I think you convinced them to have awe be one of the five emotions inside that 11 year old character. Well, Why I failed at that so effort. <laughs> What's that? I failed at that. They didn't. They didn't buy my pitch. So, well, they, but yeah. somehow they really explored the whole idea of, of what's it's, what it's like to be inside of an eleven year old. But let me ask you: Why is it important, do you think, for young people then to learn about and to experience and or understand, feel, awe and wonder? You know, I, I was involved in Inside Out, and and I did um, one of the first meetings. They asked me, Pete Doctor and Ronnie Del Carmen. You know, hey, we got five emotions. What's one emotion you would add to this young girl Riley's mind? And I was starting to get involved in all this work on awe. And I was like, you know, it's got to be awe. I mean, awe is, as Einstein said, the cradle of civilization. Uh, it is. It connects us to vast things out there like ecosystems, like in your work, Louis, uh, community, big ideas. Um, and, and I would suggest that one of the real crises we have going on in, in the world today, and in particular in the United States, is a, an awe deficit, a wonder deficit in our young people. They're working too hard, they're, test, they're being tested too much, they're not getting outside enough. Uh, it's registering in this stress and anxiety and self-harm that we see in young people. Uh, and so I think we need to return to a philosophy of awe and wonder. The best statement on it is Rachel Carson, the great environmentalist, a radical from the 50s and 60s, who alerted us to DDT and all the problems of pesticides. And she said, if she had one wish for young people, it would be wonder, because it's this indestructible force that keeps you engaged in life as you move into adulthood. So we need to return to it full force. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. I mean, you know, Richard Love's book also, Last Child in the Woods, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I do a film, Wings of Life, about pollination, which is about colony collapse disorder. And uh -huh. then I hear the other phrase, which freaks me out, nature deficit disorder. Yeah. Who would ever think that that would be like a, a, a dilemma uh, uh, that we'd have to deal with? But you're right, young people for many reasons, aren't experiencing, you know, what their parents did. Less time outdoors, you know, maybe more time in front of digital screens. Um, it can definitely, um, you know, shape their outlook. But uh, being imbued with wonder, especially in nature, will will make them, you know, fall in love with the environment and become, you know, protectors for a sustainable future. That's sort of the mission that I'm on as well. You know? And you know, I mean, the science, there are a few studies of young kids, um, you know, it's not only our connection to nature and as in the indigenous traditions, you know, they call it indigenous science, you know, which is, I don't know, you've done some filming in indigenous peoples. Like, this is how we know the world. This is the mind, the mind developed to understand nature for very good reason. But studies are showing, you know, brief encounters with nature, even in on screens you know if you see a film like yours right you suddenly feel awe and it makes kids not only appreciate the environment but they're cooperative they are better at science they're better at mathematics they kind of parts of their mind are opened up uh that have been regrettably dormant given this yeah. new educational environment so let me ask you Decker, wh why did you decide why are you so passionate about this topic. I mean, you know, you're a psychologist, you know, you teach a lot of choices. Why are you focusing on wonder and awe? Yeah, you know, one part is scientific, you know, and I'm a scientist, I have a big lab, I study the nervous system, I study evolution. And, you know, 
the the story of Inside Out is a story of five emotions, and that hewed very closely to the science of emotion from 30 years ago, which is anger, fear, sadness, disgust, joy. Um, and here's this realm of emotion of awe and beauty and ecstasy and joy that we just don't, we hadn't studied, right? And to me, that's an invitation into <laughs> discovery. But then it's personal too, you know, Louis. Um, I was raised by romantics, you know, who are kind of hippies. And my dad's an artist and my mom taught poetry and writing and literature. And, and they were all about awe. And they said, just go out and think about the world and wonder and go searching for awe like romanticism teaches us. And, you know, I can tell you as, as most of your listeners and as people when they watch your films like Fantastic Fungi, like our experiences of awe change us, right? They transform us. Mm -hmm. They, op they, I was an anxious kid, all opened me up. Um, and so, you know, why not try to give that to as many people as we can and change the world in this, this sort of poignant moment? Absolutely. It's so true because, again, you know, I've learned that, you know, and well, media does this as well. I mean, it's easy to elicit the fear response. You yeah. Know, politicians yeah. are, you know, pretty good at doing that, you know, to yeah. pressure buttons. And um, it takes a lot more talent and energy to, to get people to, you know, experience beauty, to laugh, to cry, to, to touch yeah. those emotions. And um, what I've learned, I think it's, it's almost like a muscle in the brain you need to develop because, you know, the primal reaction seems to be, you know, the initial thing is survival and, you know, anything that's fearful, I'm going to react to immediately. But even when you get good news, it kind of, you know, like you hang on to it for a minute or two and then you let go because you go on to the next emergency <laughs> yeah. and problem you have to solve. And I'm, I'm trying to lean into the idea of, of nurturing that, that feeling. Hey, somebody liked my film or something, you know, uh, good happened to, for my children. You know, a little bit of good news that you yeah. get every once in a while that you want to be able to, to savor. Does that make sense that our brain doesn't you know, dwell there as much as it could because we're not hardwired to do that? Yeah, I, you know, there's this this idea that, um, that what's called the negativity bias. We have this region of the brain called the amygdala. It's very old, helps us survive, detects threat uh, out in the environment. But I will say, Louis, you know, um, when I watched Fantastic Fungi a couple of weeks ago, um, I started to tear up. I started to get goosebumps. I dropped my mouth. I felt different, right? And that, it turns out, this awe response and wonder response is a very old response in our nervous system. I actually think it's the shift in our evolution some 80, 100,000 years ago when we started to make art and sing and be together in ceremonial ways is this new physiology that you're talking about. Um, and, and people hunger for it. Right. There's really neat work uh, by Jonah Berger showing the awe qualities of digital content are one of the most powerful predictors of its viral nature. Right. And right. I would we need more people like you. We need mm -hmm. you know, we need it. We need to move away from like, what's the latest disgusting thing that Trump did or the most fearful thing out there? Let's start thinking about cultivating you're promoting awe content. It turns out it's some of our highest forms of culture. Um, that's in need of dissemination. Amen. I, I believe that. You know, what's really great too is that, you know, because of these new platforms, you know, democratization with social media, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the dream was, you know, we get rid of the gatekeepers and we're able to disseminate, you know, information directly to the consumer from an artist to a consumer. However, we've also discovered how it's been hijacked. Yeah. Hijacked by giant corporations, by yeah. governments, yeah. by propaganda, you name it. So, um, yeah, that's one of the, the biggest issues is, is a social dilemma we're dealing with right now, right? I mean, the digital yeah. device is so you know, negative. However, we have to maybe be clear about isolating the content from the technology because right. perhaps it can have a benefit, right? Yeah, and I think that your question you know, speaks to a really important thing people need to remember is it's not the, the human brain doesn't necessarily want constant fear and, you know, immoral behavior. We, 
we are pretty wired to see patterns in nature, like in your films or the goodness in people. And it's more of a commitment of, of corporation to say like, maybe this different view of human nature is worth promoting. Um, what, what got you to the invisible world of nature? Why, why what, what struck you about the wondrous possibilities yeah. there? That's a great question. Um, I think that because I started to experiment with time lapse, because I didn't have a lot of money to shoot a lot of movie, <laughs> yeah, um, that was part of it. But really, the main part was really a sense of wonder because I was able to see, you know, life from the point of view of a flower. Mm -hmm. I was able to see life from the point of view of a redwood tree, and we learned that this, you know, human point of view is a very arrogant, limited point of view. Yeah. Um, you know, we look at things in this normal frame rate, quote unquote. But if you speed things up or slow things down, you realize that all living things have different metabolic rates, different you know, ways of looking at the world. And when you are more open minded, that's kind of the key to broadening your horizons, right? Opening your perspective, becoming more open hearted, having yeah. more gratitude, you know. Um, and so from a scientific point of view, you know, it's like I'm just saying, hey, this is how, you know, a flower lives and dies. A redwood tree looks at us as like here for a nanosecond because you're 500 years old. I mean, these are all valid points of view. Yeah, and you you can't argue with that. And I think if you looked at it as a, use it as a metaphor, every you know ethnic group, every indigenous group, every community has a different point of view. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people who who think differently than us especially in these polarized times. Yeah. And, and you have to kind of, you know, zoom out and go, wait a minute, my point of view is not the only point of view. Duh. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, and, but the fact that I can show you it, yeah. not talk about it, not say, oh, you should be open-minded. You should hear what the other guy has to say. No, I'm going to show you what it is. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm gonna, and then maybe more importantly, hopefully make you feel it mm. because we all want, you know, immersive experiences. Yeah. But we crave more than, anything is an immersive experience that's transformational yeah that'll make your life better an immersive experience could be a roller coaster ride yeah you know, whoa <laughs> and get off of me but that's not going to make your life better right? yeah yeah but to dive into like you know the flower and go into the mycelial network uh -huh. and, you know, and become a <laughs> co2 molecule and those are things that can open up and, and transform your point of view right? yeah yeah absolutely i mean they take this you know, it's interesting. One of the really interesting qualities of awe, as you've already alluded to in describing your films, is is it, it often it comes when our sense of time, our default sense of time, is mm -hmm. stretched. You know, things speed up or you slow it way down, and and uh, it just tells us uh, how important these these sort of taking different perspectives on on time and space are to to our sense mm -hmm. of awe. You know what I think happens also with the brain? Again, I'm not a scientist, but um, I think, you know, the brain always wants to kind of analyze something and, cat you know, and categorize it and pigeonhole it, kind of like you know, the guy in the, in, in the male sorting room. And, and I think that, like, if I show you the flower, you go, oh, it's a flower. No, wait a minute. Why is it moving, opening, and closing? Yeah. Is that animation? Is it CGI? In other words, it becomes liminal, and then you have to kind of deal with it yeah, and you have to try to understand it, and you can't, you know. So I want, and at the same time, you're not threatened by it, right? Yeah, because, oh, it's just a flower, right? <laughs> but the flower is is kind of you know pushing that wonder and awe button because I don't get it. I'm yeah. trying to understand it. Yeah. Well, this is one of the you know this is one of the phenomenal challenges of awe is it really is about mystery. Right. And so the human mind very often shies away from mystery. We don't like uncertainty. We don't like it when our words can't make sense of our experience, or what we're encountering. Uh, our educational systems, which we've talked about, really are oriented towards, you know, succeeding on exams and not throwing ourselves into mystery. Right. And, and that's one of the meta themes in the science of awe, Louis, is, is that's where it begins. You know, Charles Darwin you know, one of the greatest scientists to ever ever live, stepped onto that beagle full of mysteries. And, and it took him 30 years of continuing mysteries just to figure out evolution. Uh, so we gotta, 
you know, and, and it's interesting for me, Louie, you know, um, part of the reason I um, have been working on this book on awe and really accelerating the science is, um, sadly, I lost my brother, my younger brother, uh, mm. a couple years ago. And it was a big mystery for me. It was like, how could a young guy die? Uh, what is life and death? I watched him, you know, like a lot of people in our work feel awe when someone passes away. And I was like, what's it all about? And, and I followed that mystery, which was not my predilection, and it opened up all these discoveries. So, you know, the more we throw ourselves into questions like what is pollination and, you know, what is life, the, the, the more meaning we find in life. Yeah. Well, that's why I think wonder and awe is the ultimate bliss, because in looking in, in diving into the mystery, right? It makes you present. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you have to also eliminate all preconceived notions. Yeah. You have to have this blank slate. You know, like as a scientist, it's observation, right? Yeah. And and as an artist, quote unquote, it's about inspiration. You know, which means come come to it with a blank canvas. Yeah. You know, a blank mind. You know, one of the things I enjoy sharing Dakar with people is like. They go, well, Louis, do you meditate? And I go, no, not really. I don't have a practice. <laughs> my, my filmmaking has become a, a practice because I try to have my mind be as blank as a as as a, as, as a piece of film, right? Mm. Just sitting there in the dark, you know, no preconceived idea of what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, ready for light to strike, to capture any subject, yeah, without any idea, yeah, wow. You know? And isn't that a, like a cool way to, yeah, to, as, as a goal or a model to, to have your mind set at times just to be that open minded? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, I, um, you know, it, I would really um, encourage your listeners to read this wonderful book, Age of Wonder by Richard Holmes. And it's about um, this period in human history. Uh, of the age of romanticism where people did, scientists did what you do, Louis, which is they dropped their preconceptions and they just went out and experimented, right? Mm -hmm. And they went on voyages around the world and they experimented with gases and they, uh, the Herschels built this giant mic, this giant lens or telescope to look at the sky, right? Uh, they flew up in the first hot air balloons. Right. Um, and it was all about like using some technology just to like, what will I find? And it was a golden period of science and probably the same as, you think that's true of art? You, are your favorite periods of art and filmmaking about open mind and discovery? Absolutely. No, I mean, again, I'm not a giant art history uh, expert, but, you know, all those different, um, you know, modes of like, you know, abstract art, expressionism, you know, it's interesting because you know, there's just always this, you know, conversation, does art inspire, you know, the culture, or does culture inspire the art? And if you look back historically, you'll find that art is in the lead. I think artists have, have an antenna into the future. You yeah. look at the, you know, expressionism, the paintings before Hitler took, you know, power. Yeah. They were dark. They were very dark. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, that, that made me think about something. Because when I, when I was reading you know, some of the work you've been doing on wonder and awe. And I want to talk about some of them in particular, but the thing that really struck me was the idea that wonder can also be used as an abusive tool. Yeah. For example, you know, like these giant, you know, military parades you see in Korea, you know, yeah. or, or in Nazi Germany. As a matter of fact, I think Lenny Riefenstahl, you yeah. know, who was this, you know, uh, woman who did these incredible propaganda movies, you know, for the Nazi movement, I mean, she invented, you know, political propaganda. Yeah. And, and she was a talented filmmaker. Yeah. On top of it. And so I'm curious, because I never I never thought about that. I mean, share with me your thoughts how, how potentially something as, you know, beautiful and as sacred as awe can be perhaps used in a negative way. I, I mean, it's one of the most compelling questions about the emotion, right? And so in our work and in this new book, um, I think that there are kind of these, what we would call primordial sources of awe, nature being fundamental. Uh, as we've talked about the, the beauty of other people, you know, their, 
their unexpected courage and strength. Um, and then collective stuff that you and I have talked about in your films of like people moving together, dancing together, doing ceremonies together. That's old stuff. That's hundreds of thousands of years old. And then what happens is people as parts of culture come along and ritualize it and put it into different things. Sometimes it's great, right? Dance can be great. Sometimes it's exploitative. And, you know, the you uh, people have been worried about um, how religion exploits awe, right? If you use awe and it suddenly is promoting genocide of people who are different from you, that is worrisome. Um, people are worried about how forms of capitalism exploit all, you know, how uh, you can take, um, one of my favorite examples is several hundred years ago, the aristocracy had what are called uh, wonder rooms. And, and it was really these collections of weird species and artifacts from the other world, right? Uh, that gave rise to museums and like where you're collecting and commodifying wow. and taking other culture sources of awe. People are really worried about, um, you know, forms of uh, wellness, where are we taking indigenous knowledge as a white person, colonializing it, and making a lot of money off it, and not even crediting the deep traditions that might come from. So this is something we have to be on guard for, you know, as where are we exploiting awe? Because that's usually bad news for, um, for for most people. <laughs> Definitely. Well, so tell me the flip side. Now that we went to the dark side, let's, <laughs> let's talk about the positive. I mean, thank you. <laughs> let, 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 no, I, I mean, for example, dance. Yeah. For example, you know, nature. Um, yeah. All the different things, topics. I think that you have talked about, and you will in in your book. Yeah. yeah. Tell me, why do you think that it triggers wonder and awe? Yeah, I think that I think that the deep thing that happens in the mind is be it in looking at a tide pool, in dancing with a bunch of people at a concert, uh, in thinking about a big idea that really unifies your thoughts is your mind's narrow focus on the self and self-interest and separateness. Suddenly that dissolves in experiences of awe and wonder. And you feel connected in part of something large, like an ecosystem or a collection of people who are all moving together at a sporting event or a dance, or um, an intellectual movement where suddenly your sense of the world makes sense within evolutionary theory or you know quantum physics. So what, what triggers this to your question, Louis, is the sense I'm part of something large, right? Um, and then a lot of goodness ensues. And you know, about a quarter of all experiences are threatening and fearful and horrifying, but three quarters of all experiences around the world calm your stress physiology, activate the vagus nerve, trigger the release of oxytocin, activate the dopamine networks in your brain, which help you explore the world and make you kinder and more filled with wonder, right? So um, that's kind of the story that we're gleaning from this. Uh, and it tells us, you know, uh, you know, like Barbara Ehrenreich has this brilliant book on dan called Dancing in the Streets. You know, around the world for thousands of years, people danced all the time. And, and the more conservative, you know, religious parts of our Western European society said, no, that's, we don't want to dance, right? And they took this away from us. We used to sing together all the time. And now that's been taken away or it's faded from our social life. So, um, you know, these, these sources of awe are, bring a lot of good to the world and, um, and their forces countervailing our chances for them. Yeah. I think also part of it too now is sometimes because of the, you know, um, elevation of celebrities and, and yeah. quote unquote rock stars, it's like you have to be, a, you know, a great dancer or you have to be a rock star singer in order to sing. Yeah. I think singing in the shower is a good thing to do. For, yeah. You know, for everybody, you know, we all have a voice. Yeah. And it's all beautiful. Yeah. So, so Sean, well, let me, I want to show like a short little montage, especially for the people that are going to be watching this on video. Here's a little glimpse of uh, magic moments of wonder and awe just to kind of get our juices flowing. Okay. Right on. 
We are all born with a sense of wonder. Sometimes it's triggered by astonishing feats, monuments to mankind's capabilities, extraordinary talents and gifts, or scientific discoveries that push the boundaries of comprehension. But more often, we experience wonder by truly seeing the world around us. Wonder and awe allow us to transcend the ordinary. Even to test our concepts of time and scale. We are overcome with the sense of being small in the grand universe. We're unaware of past or future. We are, as they say, in the moment. We use the word breathtaking to describe it because it actually takes our breath away. Wonder inspires us to open our hearts and our minds to engender gratitude. Well, Woo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, thanks, Ted. So let me ask you, it seems like blowing your mind is a medicinal, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. good for the soul. Yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious. And you have guys like Einstein who said that, you know, they asked him his definition of God was a sense of wonder. Yeah. You know, and if you have your eyes closed, you might as well be dead if you don't feel wonder in your heart. So I'm just curious, how does wonder and all really become perhaps the core of of true mystical and or spiritual exploration. Yeah, you know, in many different ways. And and this is, um, you know, first of all, what a remarkable montage of wonder and awe. And I loved how you you brought it. You know, people often underappreciate how human awe is. Like I watching a young guy dunk a basketball always evokes awe on me. So thanks for bringing it into our attention. Um, the, you know, the, if you look at the, um, one of the universals in awe is mystical awe. Um, and it is when we encounter what we think is divine. You know, we, and by divine, William James said, it's primary, it encompasses us and connects us to things and it's good. Um, it's, it's, it's divine. Um, and we, um, in our work and in William James's work and in, in the varieties of religious experience, which was a very important radical book on uh, the relationship between awe and um, mysticism and our sense of spirituality, people, what happens psychologically is that people have this experience where they may see the ocean, like some of your footage, right? Or see birds in flight uh, and sort of suddenly have this awe experience where time slows down. Their default knowledge doesn't doesn't stand up to the test of making sense of it. And they get this intense feeling we've been describing. And then to make sense of it, they invoke ideas of the divine, right? That there is some unifying force for good that's part of everything that I might call divine or God or what have you. And, and people find it in, in scientific studies, Louis, all over the place. You know, some people it's for backpacking. Some people it's in meditation or yoga. Some people it's prayer in a religious ceremony. Some people it's almost at a football game where there's a funny study of Pittsburgh Steelers fans. And watching that team is kind of like going to church, right? So it's this remarkable process of feeling awe and then using language and ideas to say, like Emerson did, 
where he said, I'm a naturalist, but I'm a certain kind of naturalist. I see the divine in nature. Uh, I see God there. Um, and that's how we think about it psychologically, which raises a question. Louis, do you see the divine in what you film? Yeah. Is that a divine experience for you? The answer is absolutely yes. I think, you know, I'm, I'm always searching to find those rhythms and patterns that touch the deepest part of my soul. But I think what's really interesting is because it has the same effect on, on other people. So therefore, it makes you lean into the idea that there is this kind of universal consciousness yeah. that we all share. Because yeah. nobody taught any of us individually, like, what is beautiful, what is aesthetic, you know? And yet there seems to be a general common agreement that certain experiences and imagery are beautiful or, yeah. you know, filled with wonder. So it seems to be in our, you know, in our genetic code. So what, what triggers that reaction inside of me, it's beautiful that I can sh capture and share those magic moments with other people so we can all have a shared experience of yeah. wonder and awe. Mm. And, and, then, and then to have it in the communal setting, like a movie theater, yeah. it's going to church, kind yeah. of. Totally. Know, because we're all feeling it together. And you know, because I'm sure you, you know, you can study your know, heart rate variability and all the scientific measurement tools. I mean, that vibration in with surrounded by 500 or 1,000 people feeling the same sure. thing. You know, we That's feel it like at a rock concert. You yeah. know, everyone's grooving to the same thing. It elevates that energy to a much higher level. Yeah, and, you know, and and you know, I, I just have to cite Emil Durkheim here, the the elementary forms of religious life, and he really felt, you know, the great sociologist that moving with other people is the heart of spirituality, um, and and it's a part of it. I think part of it is what you've just talked about of seeing the underlying truths of the world. Um, and I agree, you know, that there's this remarkable new science of if I listen to music with other people, if I see a film with other people, if I watch a community ritual with other people, our bodies start to vibrate together and it feels divine. You know, we're part of this common humanity. And that's why, you know, your film, um, you know, it had this kind of catalytic effect on the appreciation of fungi was Let's appreciate this together and, and emote and feel together. So let me ask you this, because this is kind of interesting territory we're, we're moving into as well. Yeah. You know, you told me just at the beginning that, you know, the Berkeley Center, you're going to start to do some research with um, psychedelics. Yeah. And um, certainly what I discovered when I, you know, did Fantastic Fungi, filming the patients at Johns Hopkins, who are dealing with stress and anxiety because of an end of life, you know, a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, how they experienced this incredible sense of, of oneness. Yeah. Which enabled them to lose the fear or diminish the fear of dying so yeah. they can embrace living, yeah. which I believe help, helps them physiologically, you know, cope with whatever, you know, cancer type, you know, uh, treatment that they're going through at the same time. So I'm really excited to hear about the fact that um, that science is finally, you know, reopening the doors of investigation. It's yeah. unfortunate that Richard Nixon declared it to be illegal and yeah. made it a formal right. drug as a way of fighting the hippies in Berkeley yeah. where you were, you know, <laughs> people of color and the anti-war protesters, they were yeah. the political enemies. That's the truth. That's yeah. what happened, and all the research at Stanford and at you know uh, at Harvard, you know, all of that psychological study got shut down and not taught in in academia. So here you are in academia, shed some light on what's go what's going on. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, and I loved your cultural history of that, Louis. You know, let's not forget. You know, I mean, what a what an arbitrary cultural call it is. What we deem a legal drug, an illegal drug, come on, you know, alcohol is dangerous, right? Uh, it, and and well documented. And and so I really, you know, I, you know, having grown up, raised by hippie parents, lived in California, uh, Laurel Canyon and so forth, um, you know, 
taught at Berkeley for 25 years, we're in a really interesting cultural moment, which is the, the rise of psychedelic science. We've started a new center at UC Berkeley. I really attribute it to a couple of things. One is uh, obviously Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, and, and your film, Fantastic Fungi, and then kind of the new fungi science, which is mind blowing. Um, and scientifically, I think there are really two things at stake here um, in thinking about the promise of a science of psychedelics. One is what Roland Griffith started, um, Robin Carhart Harris, Peter Hendricks, and others, which is we have a lot of suffering in this, this country and in the world. We have deaths by despair. Our veterans are struggling. People are struggling with anxiety and depression. Uh, we need help, right? And here is a, a really time-tested approach with different kinds of psychedelics that may calm the, the nervous system down, may help us handle dying, may help us handle cancer, may help us with OCD. The data are really promising, Louis. You know, recent studies, major episodes of depression are reduced, drug addictions reduced. The second one, you know, it, the second promise of this is what the Berkeley Center for the Science of Psychedelics is gonna focus on, is what is the mind, you know? Um, in Roland Griffith's first study, 63% of people reported a mystical experience through psychedelics and awe, profound awe that changed their lives, right? Where else can you get a result like that? Maybe if you're having lunch with the Dalai Lama, but you know, that's about it. You know, it's like that is doing stuff to the brain that we need to understand, right? Uh, and sort of part of what we've been talking about thus far, like what parts of the brain give us, allow us to see underlying patterns of nature? Um, how do we do that? Does psychedelics change your immune system, right? We have data showing awe helps your immune system. Do psychedelics change your immune system in a healthy way for a long time? Does it change the expression of certain genes, right? That might account for why after psychedelics, you commit yourself to helping others. So these are fascinating questions that are very hard to study scientifically. And such psychedelics gives us a tool, but you know, our country is struggling in a lot of ways. Um, and this is a, a tool for enhancing well-being with a lot of cautions and it's illegal sure. and there are risks yeah. associated with that. Well, it's funny, look, from an anthropological point of view, <laughs> we seem to be historically going through this uh, cycle here. You know, yeah. Richard Nixon, Donald Trump, psychedelic yeah. revolution, yeah. Rio, Rio Re revolution, yeah. uh, all of this stuff. And I think it's great that there is an awakening, I feel, that is yeah. happening. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, you need to have breakdown to have a breakthrough. Yeah, We are going through these kind of times of extraordinary contrast yeah fossil fuel economy it's, yeah. it has to come down because it it'll run out in 50 years yeah. or prior to 50 years we may be dead yeah. either way it's it's a bleak future so we have to definitely shift you know what we're doing and and if if um if psychedelics can open your heart yeah. And there are studies that also show that you become less violent in prisons. Um, yeah. You know, you become environmentalists. Uh oh, look out for that. <laughs> and um, uh, because I think you, once you get the idea that that everything is alive and yeah. that it's all connected, which yeah. is really the core, you know, right spiritual concept in most you know uh, belief systems whether it's indigenous and or organized religion yeah. it's basically yeah. that you know do unto others as you would do unto yourself the golden rule so that's pretty pretty remarkable you know it's interesting we're gonna along with the study that you're doing i'm excited to say that we're going to be doing a clinical trial at the Wonderful. pacific neuroscience institute here in santa monica where we're going to use my imagery i call it visual healing mm -hmm. to treat people with alcohol addiction so the, it's a psilocybin treatment and for the first you know 40 minutes you're able to watch these beautiful amazing you know images of nature the patterns the rhythms really beautiful you know languid long shots with good music to to kind of get you into that feeling of oneness yeah. of connection and and seeing the fact that you know the veins on the leaf look like the 
the landscape of a giant glacier runoff mm. and they look like the neurological patterns in your brain you know mm. i mean to me that's like okay i'm cool with that i get <laughs> the idea it's all connected like if i die i, I have less fear than some of the other stories that are out there like heaven and hell yeah, you know yeah, yeah. i rather feel that i'm just going to be a molecule that's going to float inside this cosmic universe but that's just me so what do, what are your thoughts about that too i you know one of the one of the the concerns about awe right and you know and thinking about as you framed our show like you know united states western european although increasingly diverse thank goodness um is um we often think about wisdom and insight and contemplation and awe and spirituality is within the mind uh and and individualistic and that's part of our culture it's part of ralph Waldo emerson and william james and when i hear uh and see in our studies louis the power of visual imagery and music and artistic design and urban design you know when we show in our lab uh images of films like yours or bbc planet earth people's vagus nerve is activated their brains change they feel good and kind to other people their sense of time expands just by watching a little artistic portrayal of nature and what this all tells me is what we have to take really seriously is to use awe and wonder to design our worlds right like the indigenous peoples did in mesoamerican traditions of make it part of your home make it part of a school you know you and i talked about hospitals you know when i watched my brother get sick and and saw him in and out of hospitals it's like come on man you know this looks like a torture chamber you know we should be hospitals should be like forests uh schools and prisons so I, when i hear of studies like you just described that's where we need to go and let's not forget visual medium paintings and, and films and like yours this is one of our highest achievements and to use that you know so i hope i hope young people out there listening to your your podcast and watching your movies uh think about careers where they can you use the power of visual awe yeah you know most people don't realize that 80 percent of the data we get comes into our eyes and we have healing modalities for every other sensory receptor right yeah um, you know, yeah. music for hearing and aromatherapy for smell and uh, massage for touch, healthy food for taste. And, you know, you know, obviously one of the most important sensory receptors is our, our, our eyes. And yeah. it's almost like, don't you think it's almost like a direct connection to the brain? Because you get this like light energy that activates the retina, that sends electrical impulses, that puts the image in our head, but there is no image in your head. Yeah. Is there? Yeah. Right. I mean, what, I mean, just trying to analyze what is vision yeah. is mind blowing. It's complicated, but it is, <laughs> and, you know, and people are trying to do it with paintings right now. And, and it's very much like you're saying, like the signal goes from your eyes back to the, um, the occipital lobe in the back of your head and it starts moving towards your prefrontal cortex. And along the way, as the, the very rudimentary forms of vision start to form an image, um, it does tap into your body. And so patterns in nature, sacred geometries are like, wow, I feel good. I don't even know what I'm seeing. Uh, it does convince you that you're in nature. <laughs> so a little part of your brain is saying, I'm part of a flower or I'm smelling that flower. I feel like I'm here and that's good for the body. And then by the time it gets to where your words are in your prefrontal cortex, um, you're, you're already feeling part of nature, which is right. Dangerous, right? So uh, it's a, a, it too is a mystery filled with wonders that we need to figure out how we construct those images. I love that because I've got lots of comments from people who, who say that, you know, like the moving art series I have on Netflix is a healing modality. Yeah. Everything from stress, anxiety, teenagers being suicidal, parents with children with autism, having yeah. the breakthroughs. Yeah. And it's a mystery yeah in a way like well why does that happen but what you just described is like i think the you know the brain or the cells in your body kind of recognize you are me you know yeah. flower 
the clouds and time lapse, you know, this, this pattern, this movement is similar to the movement that's happening inside of every cell of your body. So you go, oh, great. I get it. You know, you're me. It's a homecoming. You yeah. Know? And, yeah. And, to, and then you can, you know, try to intellectually analyze why that is, but maybe you don't have to. Yeah. No, you don't have to. And, you know, it's like Ralph Aldo Emerson when he was out in a, a commons one day on a wintry day and, and he got blown away by nature and he said, you know, all mean egotism vanishes. And like you're saying, Louis, like this, oh, I'm different from you, I'm better than you, or you have more than me, that just goes with this recognition. And a lot of good stuff comes, you know, the that focus on self, a lot of data show is about makes you a little bit more depressed and anxious. Right. And, and and it and these experiences free us up from that. So um, here we are around the corner from Thanksgiving. Yeah, where it's a good opportunity not to focus on yourself yeah. but on helping others. I'd like to be able to talk about this little uh, cool thing we're doing, this gratitude food drive with Marcus Alliance. Right on. If we could put up that slide, um, you know. It's something that, that maybe everybody would like to participate in this month. We're joining in the fight against childhood hunger to spread the spirit of gratitude during these really deep transformational times. So we're working with this great organization, the Conscious Alliance, to raise funds to feed kids through an online auction. So this is a link to the fundraiser in the episode description. Uh, please take a moment to check it out. And uh, you can also find it on our websites at movingart.com and fantasticfungi.com because, um, you know, studies have shown, Dacker, that um, when you experience wonder and awe, you become more generous. Right? Yeah, yeah. And generosity, you know, opens your heart and you become more patient as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that true? Oh, my God. You know, it. it's so true it's it's astounding which is that gratitude sharing giving to charity feeling awe um you know deactivate the amygdala activate reward circuitry in the brain activate the vagus nerve which orients you to feel good and connect and it calms your immune system down then subjectively these experiences of gratitude and sharing and awe um make you feel like you're part of something big make you your stresses don't matter as much uh and boost life expectancy you know and we have been sold you know it's just our conversation to me is, is it reveals a lot of uh biases louis like why aren't hospitals filled with images of yours and 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 nature because we know it is good for the nervous system and healing you know why are we told like Ayn Rand said, that altruism is a lie and, and the worst and is a form of trait, you know, being a traitor to humanity. That's the, a lie. You know, we need to be cultivating uh, these, you know, what people like Adam Smith called the moral sentiments, because they're our, our best hope, you know. And, and I'll add, and you've brought this up in our conversation, <laughs> awe uh, and compassion make you better for the environment. Um, and so that's you know you use you eat less red meat uh yeah. if at all you use fewer uh, car, uh fossil fuels so important to be thinking about this at thanksgiving yeah i think um that's kind of the thesis that i've sort of formulated from all the years of filming that you know beauty is nature's tool for survival because we protect what we love mm. but we're being manipulated in a really good way <laughs> right <laughs> And I knew that my garden was manipulating me and was taking advantage of me or that, that redwood tree I love to go stand near. So uh, that's a form of manipulation that I'll take. Yeah. Well, I call science, it collaboration. Well, science, science calls it manipulation and art. I know. And artists call, call it love. Yeah. Either but way. There's a new, yeah. There's a new science, Louis, of, mm -hmm. of um, in particular, Tomasello and our lab that says actually there's just, enormous collaboration and cooperation across species right and and maybe this manipulation framework needs to be and that really comes out of richard dawkins and the selfish gene late 70s right, right? maybe we should be moving to a new view of, of of collaborative evolution 
Well, that's what you're doing, Decker. I, I heard your class is like the most popular class at UC Berkeley. So young people, I think, are, you know, they want that. You know, they, they, they have to have some kind of a moral compass because yeah. when you think about the fact that organized religion has basically failed, not only them, their parents. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, and there's always going to be peer pressure. And now that it's all being manipulated, as we know very clearly, yeah. by billions of dollars of effort with social media and, and um, the, the addiction, you know, psychological addiction programmed into all of these, you know, software. So, um, I, you know, nature can be the one avenue that's not preachy, that is wholesome, but can give you these important kind of, you know, moral life lessons, right? Yeah, yeah you know, and it's, the, the one of the stunning things about our, our work on awe, um, you know, we think about moral lessons as like, oh, I have to study Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, or I have to read all the great texts of the world, the sutras and the Bible and, you know, the, the Bhagavad Gita and so forth, and that's all great, right? But our, our work shows moral lessons are in nature. They are in community and being with other people. They are in listening to music. If you pick your favorite music and you listen to it to feel chills or awe, you'll come out of it a better human being, right? So we forget how human morality is and we turn it into an abstraction. Um, and and I, I think this kind of conversation um, uh, is is dearly needed because you know people are wondering like how do I teach a young kid to be moral you know what do I what should they read you know no it's <laughs> you know go yeah. play some art or get outside so I hear you amen yeah so let me ask you a question um, given you know the situation we're in right now with this pandemic etc uh -huh. um, what advice can you give to you know um, people that are listening right now, like what, what little types of everyday events can they tap into possibly to not only alleviate depression and stress and anxiety, yeah. but to experience a little bit of wonder and awe? Yeah. So, you know, it's so interesting. I mean, the pandemic, you know, depression's rising, difficulties in family, people are dying. You know, I just spoke um, yesterday to, um, 470 medical doctors and it's out of control. You know, it's just, it's not what their careers were supposed to be given the incompetence of our uh, administration, um, which they readily uh, identify. So what can we do? Um, and number one is what one of your films was about, which is gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. You know, gratitude, when I, te when I teach in San Quentin prison, uh, and those guys are in there for life and they have harder lives than anything I could ever imagine. I ask them about gratitude and they are practicing gratitude. Right? It is an instinct to do that. Go out and feel grateful for a tree or the food you're eating or the people around you. Do that. Do that once a week. A second thing is I really think it's important to cultivate a relationship to nature right now since we're so local right and and get into your garden go on a walk just spend a moment trying to get the lens of louis and looking at the nature around you just to like oh you know because that gives us health and well-being um think about new ways to express affection to people you know uh like how moved i am by your work louis you know and how grateful i am for it just get out and express that and then you know make this a moment of finding awe you know and we find awe in being out in public and walking at a farmer's market we find awe in listening to music we find awe in uh somebody's inspiring act right and just and make a commitment to it and i feel the the data show sorry to go on but if you can do that for five minutes a day you're gonna do better right even in times like today so that's what I tend to tell people. You know, it's really beautiful that you know, we're talking about gratitude. You know, we we work together with you at you know, the Greater Good Science Center and Templeton, you know, to create that series of short films called Gratitude Revealed. Yeah. And underneath yeah. the umbrella of gratitude was 
curiosity, forgiveness, you know, wonder, yeah. all those beautiful little attributes that add up to, to gratitude. And again, because I think we're coming close to Thanksgiving, yeah. it makes me think about the fact how these little acts of, of appreciation yeah. can maybe add up to this warm feeling of gratitude. Because for me, like gratitude is almost like more of a reflection yeah. of appreciating well put. You know, the little things, just using my memory, whereas yeah. in the moment I'm appreciating, you know, this incredible, you know, observation. But later on, I think, oh, wow, that dinner was really great when we all got together. Or I can't believe seeing that, you know, be pollinating the flower. And yeah. I realize that, oh, that's where our food comes from. Oh, how cool is that? So, you know, you can kind of dwell in it. You know, we... um I also think, you know, because my parents were Holocaust survivors and growing up under that roof, you realize it's all the little things in life that you have to be grateful for, which is what you mentioned earlier yeah. on how to, you know, engender awe. Because maybe if you if you just, if, if you bring in the appreciation and gratitude for the little things, I got five fingers that move, yeah. Yeah. I've got food on the table, I've got a roof over my head, perhaps it fills up the hard drive that you don't have room for the negative energy yeah. to come in. Well, we do know, you know, and I want to, you know, I hope you're, I would challenge our audience, Louis, you know, to, you know, your films slow down time and they expand awareness into the underlying patterns and, and what's there, right? Which is a reality we usually don't see. And there's a lot of that in our everyday social life of people being kind and, assisting and a child's laugh when they're playing with us you know there's so much and i challenge our audience to to find those little things as you say to be grateful for and what we know that practice which i do probably every other day for two minutes what am i grateful for you know even hard things when my brother was dying i was like what am i grateful for about my brotherhood even though i'm losing it right we know those little practices that focus on the minutia of gratitude shift your mind and for for much of the day you're suddenly noticing other things you're grateful for right they shift your body wow my heart is open the vagus nerve so i think it's i think it's one of the central challenges and one of the opportunities in the pandemic is to slow it down and to fo expand your sense of time and and find the small things and, and maybe from that point of, again, wonder and awe, where you have that blank slate, the yeah. question is, um, how do we reimagine the future? Because we yeah. don't want to go back to normal. No. You know, normal had a lot of suffering. Obviously, yeah. you don't have to detail it, but we know it yeah. around the world. So this is an opportunity to reimagine our future. Nice. And in a way, acknowledging all the suffering, let's take advantage of that as a silver lining, perhaps going yeah. forward. Do you agree? And I agree. And you, you, you know, we haven't, we're still in the trauma, right? And, and we know out of trauma, people reimagine and we'll see this going forward. But, you know, um, carbon emissions are down. So people are rethinking travel a lot and, and burning fossil fuels unnecessarily. Uh, the conversation around um, race and imprisonment, mass incarceration is just different. And policing is different. And we will transform those institutions, right? So I see the beginnings of reimagining happening. Uh, and then there's the, the, the problematic side too. There's white supremacy and guns and capitals, uh, but it's a, a moment of reimagining and we got to dive in. Do you have hope? I do, I really do. I, I feel, um, you know, it, <laughs> as long as, you know, forgive the politics, we got to get Trump out of the White House. You know, <laughs> he lost the election, uh, and I see. I think there are just there's a, a new lens on our world that is um, that has wonder in it, where we'll reimagine some things. Yeah, I think that that would be the most unbiased way of of guiding people into yeah. shaping their values. Yeah, you know, a lot of times, you know. It's interesting, you know, yeah, the films I do, you can call them a documentary. It's not investigative journal journalism. It certainly is not politically oriented. 
But I, I kind of disagree. I think they totally. are totally. They're. Why, why do you think they're political? I think they're not only political; they're moral. Right? That there is a morality and a, an idea of how we relate to the world in nature, and it's it's called evolution, you know, and and collaboration. And your films, like a political speech, awaken. They're like, oh, I'm part of an ecosystem, and that. That has implications for regulations, taxation, you know, et cetera. So yeah, no, I think I think we have to to take that on with courage. Right. Yeah. And then we allow people to make their own decisions, yeah, their own choices based on the heart. Yeah. Right. It's not like a to-do list, oh yeah, I gotta recycle. You know, I gotta have to have drive an electric car. I mean, for me, every time I have a piece of paper in my hand that I'm going to toss into the trash can. I don't, not because I remember my to-do list. It's because it, it hurts me to think about trees being cut down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. that's what motivates me. And then I end up doing the right thing. You know, it's just because it hurts my heart to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Well, this has been a great, great talk. Um, oh. In any, Dacker, and any any suggestions? I mean, here you are at the center of all this research, the Greater Good Science Center, the studies you're about to do with psychedelics. For all the people that are listening, um, you know, during this kind of time of uncertainty, how about uh, a little bit of words of wisdom going forward? What can they do to either, you know, maybe you know, go to Greater Good Science Center to learn what you yeah. guys are up to, um, or 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 you could, you know, be philosophic. Uh, way. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I would encourage people to go to greatergood.berkeley.edu, uh, where we have 20 years, you know, we've collaborated with you. We have 20 years of content for people for free. Um, and then I think, you know, uh, working so much on Awe and Wonder right now, um, and Awe and Wonder, you're the first podcast, you were the first filmmaker it's it's coming right it, it's books are coming practices are coming and i would encourage our audience to think about what are three sources of awe and wonder that they can find in their house right and and just tap into one each day you know and it might be a piece of music it might be a, a film like yours it might be a, a walk outside it might be uh walt whitman Right or somebody's prose uh, might be watching films about Black Lives Matter. Tap into a few, a little bit of that each day, and 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 you that is coming in terms of healthcare. And why not start now? All right. Well, thank you for being a leader into. Yeah, I think bringing the heart into things like you know psychology, healthcare, academia. Any guy that serves, you know, I have total respect <laughs> for. Okay. Uh, because that is the ultimate experience of being in the moment. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's hard to think about past, present, or future, <laughs> or, or your to do you list. Have no choice. You're, trying to, you're trying to catch that wave. I love the metaphor of being just also to be in the right spot, in the right place and time to catch the wave, to yeah. be to be present enough to connect with the moon and the stars and the planetary system that manipulates the currents and the waves that you're like allowing yourself to be aware of. Yeah. You're part of, part of that big part system. of it. Yeah. And a little bit of that every day goes a long way. It does. Absolutely. Well, thank All you, right. Louie. It's always yeah. good to be in conversation with you. It's always good to see your, your film, you know, your film work. So thank you. And so I want to also give a special thanks to uh, the Fetzer Institute for sponsoring our podcast to help build you know, a spiritual foundation for a loving world. And I also want to be able to thank, you know, everybody on my team, Leland, Annie, Sarah, Courtney, everybody there for Moving Art and for for Bethany, Ron, Jason, and Sean for Magical Threads. Um, it takes a village to do what we do. And I'm so grateful that we have this mycelial connection with so many people around the globe that are wanting to connect during these times when disconnection is a little bit more difficult. We can do it virtually and I'm grateful for that.
Thank you, everybody.